Hey guys, this is Mr. Mitchell. Today we're going to be talking about friction. So first we need to define friction. What is friction? Friction is just a force that acts to prevent one object from slipping on another object. So I have two objects that are touching each other. Friction is working to prevent them from gliding across each other like this. Uh, there's two ways that it can work, right? Friction either opposes motion. So I have two objects that are moving on each other and friction is working against that motion or friction can actually create motion uh, in another sense. And so we're gonna explore what that kind of looks like here right now. There's three ways that friction can actually act. So the first one uh, is that an object that is not moving and the friction between that object and the surface, it actually keeps it from moving altogether. So an object's not moving and friction between that object and the surface keep it from moving at all. So if you have a person, right, he's here, he's pushing a box, okay, the box is in contact with the ground. And so he's applying a big force to move this box, but friction is actually working against him and it prevents the box from moving at all. So the force of friction uh, keeps the, the two object, or keeps the object from moving at all. The second way that friction can act is that as the object glides across another object, so it's actually moving this time, friction opposes the motion and eventually stops the sliding object. So if you've ever played mini golf or you've ever played real golf uh, and you've gone, gone to make a putt, right? You hit the ball and the ball starts moving, but if you don't hit the ball with enough force, you see that it kind of slows down, slows down, slows down. It doesn't quite make it to the hole. So the reason that that happens is because of friction. Friction is moving or is pushing against that motion and it slows the ball down so that it doesn't go as far as you want. So in that case, the object is gliding across, or the, the ball is gliding across the green, and friction is moving against it to prevent it from moving. The last case is that special one where friction actually causes the object to start moving. And so uh, one of the best ways to illustrate this is a, is a runner. And so we have a runner, right? He's in contact with the ground, and he's just trying to get started in his race. And so what does he do? He pushes his foot down on the ground really hard. All right, so he pushes his foot down really hard and friction is actually working to oppose that motion so it actually pushes him forward and so what does he do he starts racing forward so his the, the reason that friction helps him move is that if friction wasn't there his foot would just slide across the the ground right and he wouldn't go anywhere It'd be like the cartoons when they're running and their feet just keep going on the ground but with friction friction works against that motion of his foot going backwards to drive his body forwards and so friction actually starts the motion in that case so what does the amount of friction depend upon? We've seen how it can act, but we want to know what does the, the actual force of friction depend upon? There's two things. The first one is the texture of the two surfaces that are touching. So again, we have a box that's sitting on the ground, right? And so there's the box itself, which is represented by this orange color up here, and then there's the ground, which is this greenish color down here. On the surface, we look at those, and they look pretty smooth, right? There's not any bumps in the road or anything. But if we go down to the microscopic level, we sort of see that the surfaces aren't as smooth as they seem. And so we have this really rigid, weird-looking surface for the box, and then we have another rigid, weird-looking surface for the ground. So what happens is I start pushing the box across the ground, but all these little snags get caught on each other, and it prevents the objects from moving. Right? So friction depends upon those surfaces. You can imagine like a piece of sandpaper versus a smooth piece of sheet metal. Right? The sandpaper is all nasty, rigid looking, and the, the smooth piece of metal is really smooth. So one is going to slide a lot easier than the other. And so that's kind of the texture that we're talking about. Friction depends upon that surface. The second thing is the force that's actually pushing the two surfaces together. So a lot of times we're talking about an object that's on the ground and we're trying to push it or slide it. Um, and so typically we'll be looking at the weight of the object when we talk about this force. But that's not to say that you couldn't have, you know, the force that's pushing your hands together that's creating friction. Um, but the example I'm gonna go, go with depends upon weight. So I have two objects here, right? I have an empty cardboard box and I have a big heavy safe. Now, if I had both of these objects sitting on the ground and I was trying to push them, what do you imagine would create more of a difficulty for me? Probably the safe, right? And the reason that the safe is harder to push is because it has a greater force of friction working against me. And the reason behind that is that the safe is really, really heavy. 
All right, so the box has nothing in it. There's no weight pushing it down. There's no weight pushing it into the surface of the floor. And so when I go to push it, it's really easy to move. But when I go to push the safe, the safe has got a lot of force pushing it down into the ground. So it's almost like they're grinding together, the ground and the safe. And when I go to push it, right, I'm applying that force and it's a lot more difficult to move because the friction is higher. So the amount of friction depends upon the texture of the surfaces, what do they look like at the microscopic level, and the force that's kind of pushing those two objects together. The bigger the force is, the harder it's going to be to push. So how about the energy transfers that happen, or energy transformations that happen with respect to friction? Uh, when two surfaces slide past one another, the force of friction is actually doing work. All right, so um, we have a force that we're applying over a distance, okay, and so anytime we have that, work is being done. In most cases, friction is going to do work and transform kinetic energy, the energy of motion, into thermal or heat energy, which is the random kinetic energy of particles. And so um, think about the simple example, this classic example of rubbing your hands together, right? When you rub your hands together, right, I'm taking kinetic energy, I'm pushing two objects together, applying a force, and that kinetic energy of the motion gets converted into thermal energy to warm my hands up, all right? So this is a nice thing to do in the wintertime when it's cold outside, you can just apply some science, kinetic energy to thermal, by using this friction between your hands. So that's one example of actually when that energy transfer from kinetic to thermal is desirable. That's, that's something we want to happen. When my hands are cold, I use this whole force of friction and kinetic energy to transform into thermal energy, and that's a desirable effect for me. Another one would be uh, to go back to the car example. Think about the brakes in your car. You're driving, 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 and you have a lot of kinetic energy, and now you need to slam your brakes on and stop. Well, the brakes, just kind of grab the tires and cause a lot of friction to happen between the brake and the tire. And what does that do? It takes all that kinetic energy of the tire moving forward and transforms it, just like from your hands rubbed together, it transforms it into thermal energy. Now the thermal energy, the brakes get really hot, but you're slowing your car down, you're transforming that energy. So that's a desirable effect. We can go back to the car example again for one that's actually not really desirable at all. So if you think about the engine in your car, every so often you have to change the oil. Well, what does the oil do? Oil is really slippery, it helps prevent friction. So what are we trying to prevent? In your engine, there's a bunch of pistons, right? Little metal cylinders and they, they move up and down and that's what helps drive the tires. So they're metal and the engine that they're sitting in is metal and they tend to rub up against each other. We don't want lots of heat in the engine because we could melt the metal together and that's a big, big problem. So we put oil in the car and that goes in between the piston and the engine block and it helps to kind of reduce that friction. And that way we don't get a lot of this transfer into thermal or heat energy. We kind of reduce that because we're reducing the friction. We're just keeping that kinetic energy moving. So our final example uh, has an application to how that whole friction can cause motion to happen thing that we said earlier. So the force of friction can actually, instead of transferring the energy from kinetic to thermal, we can transfer the energy from, or transform, I'm sorry, transform the energy from kinetic to thermal. We can transfer the energy kinetic in one object to kinetic in another object. So the force of friction can transfer the energy to an object. So the bike uh, that I have down here, pictured down here, is an example of that, right? You apply some kinetic energy to kind of pedal the tires around. All right, and so the chain connects that, and you're making the tire spin around. So it's got a lot of kinetic energy because it's moving. It's moving around in a circle. Well, the tire is also in contact with the road down here, and it doesn't want to slide on the road. It wants to grab. That's why they make the tires out of rubber, to maximize the friction. So the tire grabs onto the road, and there's a lot of friction between the tire and the road. And what does it do? The tire wants to move back this way, but friction wants to oppose it, and so it pushes forward. And so you, on your bike, start going forward because now friction is opposing that motion to get you started. In that case, I'm taking the kinetic energy that I'm applying to the pedals and to the wheel and turning it into kinetic energy that actually pushes me and the entire bike forward. So that's actually a desirable example. That's, that's an ideal situation where we have friction that's causing motion to happen. So hopefully this was a helpful introduction, uh, at least to the idea of friction and maybe some of the applications uh, that we'll use moving forward.